Hello, Stanton students. Welcome to your lecture on the Spanish and Portuguese empires. We will be discussing the key concepts 4.1 and 4.3. The th key things that you should pick out from this part of key concept 4.1 uh, is that transoceanic voyages are made possible through technology um, technological innovations uh, and this brings about a whole new era of long-distance trade throughout the entire world uh, along with this trade spreads religion and along with that diseases as well so those are the things that you should make sure you place emphasis on for this key concept Key concept 4.3 is about state expansion or imperial expansion. We'll be <clears throat> discussing briefly the differences of the ideas of empires that we saw in like unit two with the empires of Rome and Persia uh, or the Han dynasty and the differences between those kinds of empires and the sea-based empires that we'll see uh, from this point forward, <clears throat> 1450 on forward. Um, and so the characteristics of these empires is that they expand territory not necessarily connected to their, their kingdom or their state where they're ruling from. All right, so typically the word we use for this is imperial with an I, right? Not empire with an E. So we'll talk more about the differences between what is imperial and what is an empire. All right, so the beginning of the territory of Spain as we understand it today begins with what's called the Reconquista. And so <clears throat> after the spread of the Islamic empires uh, in the seventh and eighth century, those empires, those Islamic empires, spread in through over North Africa and up into Spain across the Strait of Gibraltar, which the you can picture the Mediterranean Sea going around, you know, the area to the east here. And the Strait of Gibraltar runs just underneath that lowest portion of Spain at the bottom of the map, right? You know, there's a tiny bit that almost connects North Africa to Spain. And so uh, the Muslim empires crossed over into Spain and controlled quite a bit of territory of what's called the Arabian or Iberian Peninsula. That is the peninsula that you're looking at here that contains both Portugal and Spain. Uh, and so <clears throat> Spain was not a united uh, place, even the areas that were not controlled uh, by Muslims at this point. You can see the kingdoms in the north, the kingdom of Galatia, of Asturias, Castile, uh, Barcelona, you know, these were separate kingdoms with their own rulers and were not unified. <clears throat> so this is what we're looking at around the period of 900 CE. Okay, so, but by 1300 CE, you can see that many of these kingdoms regain most of what is Spain. Uh, and so the final battle coming in 1492, that date should sound familiar, right? You typically think of Columbus sailing the ocean blue in 1492. But another, uh, maybe just as important event that happens in that year is that that is kind of the final battle at the Battle of Granada, which kind of reconquers Spain for the Spanish. <clears throat> the Battle of Granada was an eight month siege, um, so it wasn't any quick event by any means, and part of the reason for uh, the downfall of, of the Muslim Empire out of Spain is because uh, the Mamluk Egyptian Turks uh, 
were battling with the Ottoman Turks at this time, and so part of their focus was centered towards the Ottomans and not in Spain. The Muslim empires leave their impact in Spain. Um, some of you might have you know, read about uh, Cordoba and this uh, kind of cosmopolitan city in Spain that, uh, you know, was thriving with science and art uh, and architecture. Um, another part uh, or another element that Muslims leave or another impact that they have in Spain is, is with the language. There's quite a few Spanish words. Uh, like if you know oil, which is a sete, uh, that's a, an Arabic word, uh, as is sugar, azúcar, or uh, pillow, almohada, all those are, are Arabic words that Spain adopts. <clears throat> uh, so there's quite a, quite a bit of influence, of Arabic influence in Spain as a result of this. And you can see that there's a separate kingdom of Portugal that arises as a result of this as well. So this brings us to the great exploration, um, <clears throat> age of exploration. And so we see the Re Reconquista ends in 1492 after the fall of Granada. And so uh, what this stokes in the people of Spain is this uh, pride and uh, Catholicism of uh, reconquering this territory for Christianity, for Catholicism. And so they see that in this way. Um, so <clears throat> they saw part of their mission uh, as to reconquer the rest of the world for Christianity, um, for Catholicism. And uh, they saw that as, you know, when they landed in the New World, they saw uh, conquering Native Americans there as part of that. Uh, another reason for this is um, they believed or they wanted to find a new trade route to India to, uh, instead of having to go through um, the Ottoman Empire. And... What they believed was there was this mythical kingdom of Prester John uh, that was supposed to um, supposed to reside near India, and this was a mythical kingdom, Christian kingdom within India, and uh, they wanted to reconnect with that kingdom there. Okay. There are technological reasons um, for the age of exploration, of course. You all probably remember um, these square sails of the Mediterranean Sea uh, that were needed because the Mediterranean often didn't have very gusty winds, and so <clears throat> ships required these large square sails to uh, try and capture as much wind as possible within the Mediterranean. Um, but the problem with those sails is that they're not good for navigating, for controlling the ship and making it go where you want to. Um, however, there was also in the Indian Ocean, these lateen sails, these triangle shaped sails, which were very good for navigating through, <clears throat> uh, rough winds. All right, but on the other hand, they weren't good for long distance travel, uh, the triangle sails. And so essentially one of the great uh, technological advances that happens during this time is simply the combination of these sails into one ship. All right, and so uh, the caravel, the Portuguese caravel, which is a picture of uh, the ship up at, at the top here, which basically just uses lateen sails, it's kind of the, one of the first ships used for long distance sea travel. Um, but once you combine these two types of shale, sails into one ship, you have a sail or you have a ship that can go long distances fairly quickly because it can capture quite a bit of wind with these huge square sails. Um, but it, it can also navigate well because of the lateen sail. And uh, what the lateen sail helps you do is tack against the wind. Uh, and so 
you can't always go with the wind. Sometimes you have to go against the wind. And what tacking does is you essentially go at a 45 degree angle into the wind so that you can still go forward against the wind, basically. <clears throat> and then there's other technologies, uh, many that happen as a result of you know, trade that we've seen earlier throughout the Middle Ages that happens through the Silk Road. Um, technologies from China, including the compass, comes from China. Better maps um, as well. All of this helps spark um, the ability to travel further by sea. All right, and so a third reason then for the beginning of these explorations is for trade. Um, Spain was not able to end Portugal. Neither of them were able to access really uh, the trade going on in India, the spice trade going on there, which was highly valuable. Um, Portugal, uh, Portugal and Spain typically uh, just traded through North Africa and so they believed or they wanted to find alternate trade routes to India either around the Horn of Africa or simply by heading west right okay before we talk about uh, Columbus, um, who wasn't Spanish, he was Italian, but uh, commissioned by the Spanish government for his, his travels, we need to talk about the Portuguese, um, because they begin exploring down the western coast of Africa about 50 years before Columbus set sail. Okay, so they begin exploring down the coast of Africa um, in 1420 um, <clears throat> and they uh, encounter quite a few islands off the coast of West Africa uh, the Azores Cape Verde Islands Sao Tome what's interesting or what what kept them from doing this before was that uh, that western coast of Africa that's next to the Sahara Desert it just isn't very populated and so there wasn't much activity for trade. And so in order for the Portuguese to find any uh, places to, to inhabit or places where they could set up trading posts, they had to travel quite a bit down south of Africa before they get around that part, that western part of Africa. <clears throat> and, you know, there was uh, myths that as you got closer to the equator that perhaps the waters of the ocean there would be boiling um, and so myths like that kept them from exploring that area before but in the 15th century around the 1430s um, they begin uh, making their way down that western coast of Africa and setting up trading posts there uh, and so by 1488, Bartolomeu Diaz uh, rounds the very t southern tip of Africa, um, and then uh, Vasco da Gama will finally uh, successfully lead an expedition to India. And so what that means is that uh, Portugal has successfully opened up this trade route all the way around the coast of Africa into India. This is a, a major, uh, major development because it means Portugal is no longer limited to simply Europe and Northern Africa and the Mediterranean. Uh, their trading is now opened up all along the coast of Africa where they traded with Africans as well, uh, but into India as well. <clears throat> and one more note, um, part of the reason why uh, Columbus believed that he was reaching uh, reaching the Far East, reaching uh, India, was that he simply miscalculated the, the circumference of the Earth, uh, which the Portuguese believed that he was 
miscalculating how small the circumference of the Earth was. Okay, this shows uh, the points at which the Portuguese landed in parts of Western Africa as they explored down that coast. Henry the Navigator, uh, ruler of Portugal, um, did a lot to encourage um, the development or encourage this trade, this exploration, establish maritime schools. Um, and something we should distinguish is the way that Spain and Portugal fund these expeditions as opposed to the British and the French and the Dutch. All right, so you're going to have a different lecture on those empires and so the exploration and colonization of the British, the French, and the Dutch because they do that through joint stock companies, essentially privately uh, funded expeditions. Whereas Spain and Portugal, on the other hand, will fund these expeditions through what's called mercantilism or the combination of or state funding for these expeditions okay so the government is putting a um, is providing the money for these expeditions in the belief that it will return riches and trade uh, and money and wealth for the kingdom for the empire um, as they explore Okay, this is just a little more about Prince Henry, uh, the navigator, um, along with the maritime schools, uh, he improves navigation instruments. I mentioned Vasco da Gama rounds the Cape of Good Hope in uh, 1487. And along the way, like I mentioned, they s establish Portuguese trading posts where uh, Portuguese individuals stay in these places in Africa and trade with uh, the Angolan Empire, the Congolese Empire. Um, and by 1519, Ferdinand Magellan uh, successfully is able to circumnavigate the globe. Um, I say successfully, he dies along the way, but his fleets, or his, his one of his ships in his fleet, is able to successfully return. And so while he does not, um, he does show or he proved that it is capable uh, for ships to completely circle around the globe. Okay, on to the Spanish Empire and Spanish expeditions. Uh, Philip II of Spain will rule during much of the time that these beginning uh, explorations to South America, Central America, will be going on. Before him, however, um, uh, King Ferdinand and Isabella, the king and queen of the Kingdom of Castile, which will essentially be the basis for unification in Spain, um, they, they see themselves as defenders of Catholicism, okay? So after this Reconquista of kicking out uh, uh, the Muslims from Spain, there's this uh, pride in Catholicism and this wanting to keep Catholicism for Spain and spread Catholicism to other places. This is, wasn't just uh, against Islam, but also Protestantism. And so, <clears throat> in another lecture, we'll discuss um, what happens during the Protestant Reformation, uh, this another split in the Christian Church uh, between Catholics and Protestants, where uh, Germany and England uh, will become Protestant, uh, and Spain will remain Catholic. And so, King Philip saw not just Muslims and Jews as as heathens, but also Protestants. Okay, and we'll see how this is, is manifested here in a second. Um, <clears throat> and this leads to 
what's called the Spanish Inquisition, which was persecution of anyone who was non-Catholic. So this could be um, Muslims or Jews, but also Protestants as well. And this was a time when uh, people were both expelled for not being Catholics, or at times uh, tortured and questioned about their faith. Um, okay, and the Spanish Armada is a, a good combination of this use of new technology and this idea to uh, or this this war against Spanish uh, Catholic Spain and Protestant England right uh, Henry the eighth has claimed uh, England as the Church of England and made himself both the head of state and head of the Church of England and uh, King Philip saw this as heathenistic, and so part of the reason was that for this reason he wanted to uh, battle the British fleet, and the British Navy, essentially. Um, and so it was for that reason, but he also uh, wanted to dominate trade um, at this time. And at this time, uh, the Netherlands, which is right across the English Channel, was technically a part of Spain and King Philip II wanted to control that area. And so what he does is he sends this enormous fleet of ships up to England to combat the British fleet. And I think this picture up at the top probably gives you a good idea of what this would have looked like. <clears throat> the Spanish fleet uh, had greatly outnumbered the British fleet. The Spanish fleet would be represented uh, on the right there, that kind of half moon crescent. And so when they reached the channel, the English Channel, this is kind of the formation that they took. And the British ships, like I said, were quite outnumbered, yet they were able to defeat the Spanish Armada, this huge armada of ships, um, just through the tactics that they used. Uh, and part of that was sailing up behind the Spanish fleet like this. They also used uh, kind of terror tactics where uh, the Spanish Armada would be like docked for the night and the British fleet would take one of their ships and set it on fire and just sail it kind of blindly with no one on it into the Spanish fleet to kind of make them scatter and, and terrorize them. So, like I said, this is a good illustration of some of the reasons, uh, you know, Spain, King Philip wanting to expand his empire, uh, combat Protestantism, uh, control trade, and also to um, control passage to what was believed to be his territory, the Spanish Netherlands. Okay, so this brings us to the first Spanish explorations of the New World. Um, Columbus makes his first voyage in October 1492, lands in the Caribbean, um, and he would make three other trips following that, all of them believing that he was landing in India, in the East, East Asia. And he would die thinking that he had done just that. A lot of people talk about this as the discovery. I think about, I think a better word for this is the Great Encounter, and uh, this is a monumental event uh, for the Eastern Hemisphere to finally come in contact with these two continents that had previously been disconnected to them, um, and so after this we see. Uh, Hernan Cortes take down the Aztecs, um, Francisco Pizarro take down the Incas, which they'll be on another slide here in a second. And so they expand, the Spanish expand their empire throughout Spain over the next course of the next couple of years uh, to control parts of North America in California, Arizona, New Mexico, 
in Florida as well, and um, through Mexico, Central America, South America, they controlled a huge territory in the New World. And so, um, you know, we tend to think about the beginning uh, of the United States in terms of the founding of Jamestown and uh, Plymouth Rock. Um, however, it's important to keep in mind that the Spanish was exploring up through Mexico into West, uh, the Western, what's now the Western United States, um, long before this time. Well, not long before, but before this time. I know I will discuss in class uh, with the students a little more of what happens with the encounter of what were the Arawak Indians uh, that Columbus encountered uh, in um, the Caribbean when he first lands. Um, but it's uh, a little haunting to read the diary of Columbus and how he discusses uh, the indigenous people that he meets when he first lands. Um, he talks to them as being very naive, that they grab his sword without even knowing that it's, a, you know, that it's sharp and they cut themselves as a result of it, uh, and that they trade away almost everything they have without, you know, without any, uh, thought to it. Um, but we will discuss that more in class. Okay, so the, the two main conquistadors that you should uh, remember are Hernán Cortés and Francisco Pizarro. Cortés conquering the Aztecs uh, with very few Spanish conquistadors. He's able to uh, conquer the Aztec Empire. I know I've spoken about this already, talking about the fall of the Aztecs. And Francisco Pizarro conquering the Incas near Peru. And what this leads us into is colonial Spanish America. Um, just a side note, Cortes was able to use other indigenous uh, Central American tribes who had, uh, had good reason not to like the Aztecs and use them to their advantage to help them take down the Aztecs. Francisco Pizarro took advantage of a civil war that was going on in the Peruvian or the Inca Empire, um, the, which uh, was a debate going on between who would take leadership of the Inca Empire because they had no clear successor. Oh, it's a question about whether or not um, smallpox was deliberately spread by the Spanish. It's not clear uh, whether or not this was done on purpose. Uh, we know that part of the big reason for the decimation of the in indigenous population in the Americas is because of disease. Um, many think that the Spanish gave, uh, Spanish and North Americans gave indigenous peoples uh, either blankets or other items that were in infected with smallpox or uh, another disease as a way to combat indigenous peoples, basically a, a form of biological warfare. Um, but this is debated and it's not clear uh, whether or not Europeans actually did this intentionally. Okay, back to talking about Portugal. After the encounter of the Americas, um, it was discussed with Spain and Cor Portugal and the Pope about what would be done to split the territory that was newly found by Spain. And so a treaty was made called the Treaty of Tordesillas which essentially, essentially divided the world in two. You can see the 
circle up at the top of this map here. If you imagine like a line going from top to bottom of this map uh, on the right side of this circle, kind of splitting Brazil in half here, that would be the essentially the Treaty of Tordesai that said basically Portugal can t claim or take any territory east of that line, and I'll show you another picture of that line here on the next slide, and that Spain can have everything west of that line. And what's interesting about uh, Brazil, we haven't talked about how Portugal finds or kind of encounters Brazil, uh, but in their expeditions along Africa here, <clears throat> Brazil is claimed uh, for Portugal in 1500 by Pedro Cabral and what Cabral was doing is he was part of these expeditions that would travel down uh, Africa around into India and then head back in. he was part of this trade going down to Africa what the Portuguese realized was that <clears throat> they could fairly easily travel south along the coastline down to Africa but it was a little more difficult for them to travel back up that coast. And so what they, the explorers would do is that they would kind of swing out into the Atlantic Ocean to catch winds that would carry them back to Portugal. And so on one of his trips back, what Cabral would do uh, was he was going back from India and went out into the Atlantic to try and catch those winds, and whoops, he hits Brazil. And that's how the Portuguese and Cabral essentially discovered, I say discovered, but or encountered Brazil, is that they did it very much on accident, simply trying to get home from India. All right, some other explorers that you should take note. Amerigo Vespucci uh, is uh, kind of the first person to call the Americas a new continent, which is where we get that name, America. And uh, Vasco Nunez de Balboa is able to cross Panama, the, what we call the Isthmus of Panama, um, and to see the Pacific. All right, so this gives you an idea of the Treaty of Tordesillas. This was not something that was uh, really set in stone and so it was a line like I said that divided the territory of Portugal and the territory of Spain and this kept on getting pushed further west as Portuguese or as Portugal uh, state claim to Brazil further and further west um I don't know if you remember on that previous or one of the first slides that I was mentioning Portugal but uh, what the Portuguese were doing in uh, these islands off the coast of Africa and uh, off the coast of Europe uh, were setting up sugar plantations. Uh, and so sugar was becoming highly profitable. And they realized that in Brazil, uh, Brazil happened to be a very good place for growing sugar as well. And so this is when the Portuguese king realized that at, in the beginning, Portugal had didn't have much interest in Brazil, but after they realized that it was a place where sugar would grow well, um, this became very important for the Portuguese empire. <clears throat> okay. So, after the beginning encounter of Spanish America and the downfall of the Aztecs, the downfall of the Inca, um, we see the formations of these what are called vice royalties and these are, are huge provinces that are claimed by Spain and set up with governors in each province. Okay, so you would have, you know, the vice royalty of New Spain in what's basically Mexico today, um, or the vice royalty of Peru, which in, takes up both Chile and Peru, vice royalty of the Rio de la Plata, which is down near Argentina, and uh, what I will say is, uh, you know, a lot of the indigenous 
populations of Brazil were wiped out uh, when the Portuguese landed there. Um, but many of the sedentary indigenous of like the Aztecs and the Inca did a lot better. And well, their, their populations remain there at least. And so there was still a, uh, an indigenous population in the Americas there. Um, we'll talk a little more about colonial America and the division of uh, ethnic groups or ethnic classes in Spanish colonial America uh, as opposed to North America and why that is. Uh, but we'll, we'll talk about that in another lecture. Okay, and finally, um, so part of the economy of early colonial Latin America is made up of, you know, what you saw before, sugar plantations, especially in the Caribbean and Brazil, uh, silver mines in Peru and northern Chile, well, what is now northern Chile, um, and what the Spanish did were set up these uh, labor groups called encomiendas, which uh, would entrust a group of indigenous people to a governor or to a, a Spanish lord, you could say. It was something that might be f similar to feudalism, right? Encomienda literally means to entrust, all right? So this was where... Uh, a Spanish citizen would have a group of indigenous people under his control, uh, both for labor, but also as uh, as a way to try and get these indigenous to convert to Christianity and uh, get them to speak Spanish. Um, it would be both like an education group uh, as a way to try and convert inv indigenous people and also as a, a way to f use them for forced labor. So that's what encomiendas are. <clears throat> and what we'll see though is uh, the indigenous population is much less willing to work uh, and um, they quite frequently die from diseases brought from the old world, and so this will usher in um, the need for the, the Spanish and the Portuguese uh, to bring slave labor from Africa. And so this is a, a way for us to transition to say um, into what will be colonial Latin America and the transatlantic slave trade, which we'll talk about here in another lecture. All right, so thanks for listening.